This program is brought to you by Emory University. Hello, this is such a uh, pleasure to be here. I'm so delighted to have been invited by Kevin and Sheila, who I admire tremendously, and I'm so excited being at Emory. Uh, and I've been really taken with the, the quality of the education that I'm seeing just in the last couple of days. Uh, it's a very dynamic and engaging atmosphere here. <clears throat> so I have to, we don't have a whole lot of time and I have a lot of things that I want to share with you, so I'm going to try to move through them expediently. Uh, what I'm going to try to do this afternoon, this evening, is take you on a trip to two places. First, we're going to go to London to the Globe Theatre, and then we're going to go to the Woodburn Correctional Facility, a medium security prison in upstate New York. Uh, and the footage that I'm going to show you there, from there, was shot two weeks ago. Uh, and I'm just beginning to, I, we, we shot 30-something hours of footage over five days. Uh, I was able to, what I did was I, I was the interviewer for a extraordinary festival in London last spring called the Globe to Globe Festival. It was a pre-Olympic event, part of the World Shakespeare Festival in England. And uh, Dominic Dromgoul, the head of the Globe Theater, uh, had this extraordinary concept which he told us was probably impossible to pull off and he and his extraordinary small team at the Globe did pull it off and what they did was they engaged 37 theater ensembles from all over the world uh, they assigned each of the great Shakespeare plays to each one of the ensembles and they came to London and on a daily basis a new theater company, showed up at the airport, got escorted to the hotel, set up in a performance and a rehearsal space, and then gave an afternoon matinee the next day, and the third day an evening performance, which was videotaped by the BBC. So in six weeks, they did all 37 plays in 37 languages. <clears throat> it was a really stunning event, and I, I saw about 34 of the productions, and I interviewed about almost all of the directors and many of the actors. And when I got back, uh, I, had been, I had done some interviews at this Woodburn Correctional Facility where they have a, a volunteer, uh, a nonprofit program called Rehabilitation Through the Arts, which is the brainchild of this extraordinary woman named Catherine Vokens, uh, who was a former businesswoman who, uh, when she retired from business, she decided that she wanted to pursue this new career of working with prisoners and she has a concept that teaching prisoners art is a path towards rehabilitation. And I had been there before a couple of years ago and it was a very uh, moving experience for me. So I talked to Catherine and I asked her, I said, Catherine, you know, a couple of these videos from the Globe would be really wonderful to show the men at Woodburn. And do you think that, that I could teach a class, show them these videos, and then film the class, film them talking about the videos and the reaction to the videos? So we put our heads together and we decided to show them a Spanish, most of the men are black and Hispanic. So we decided to show them a Spanish language production of Henry IV, part one, produced by the folks from Mexico City. And we decided to show them a winter's tale produced in the Yoruba language from Nigeria, from Lagos, from this wonderful theater group there, and uh, something called the Othello Remix, produced by Chicago Shakespeare, which is a hip-hop interpretation of Othello. And I thought that the men there would respond to these things and we could have a conversation both about international Shakespeare and who owns Shakespeare, and is Shakespeare just for university people? Is it just for white people? Or does it have a broader, a broader base of audience in the 21st century? And then also to engage the men in conversations about the large human issues in the place, things like betrayal, murder, uh, honor, manhood, uh, and redemption and forgiveness. So just at the end of November, I think right after Thanksgiving, we got, finally got permission from the New York State Department of Corrections to do both things, to teach the class and to bring the film crew. 
and I had to scramble quite a bit to get it all together, and, <clears throat> and here I am. So what, what I want to do first is I want to take you to the globe, and I want to show you that just the, qu the quick introductions, because we don't have time, to two, maybe three of these productions. So uh, one thing that was interesting about these three productions is that they were very different in their interpretations. And this one is more a classical reading of the script, true to the story, true to the script, just translated into Spanish, and a very elegant production with elegant costumes and a very inventive, creative set with these wooden blocks that they moved around. The next one that we're going to take a look at is from Nigeria. Uh, it's The Winter's Tale. In the Winter's Tale, if you know the story, it has a, it's a story of Leontes, the, uh, who, he has a best friend who's a king from another country, and he gets jealous and thinks that, the, uh, that his friend is having an affair with his wife. In the Nigerian production, they translated the three main characters to the three main gods and goddesses of Yoruba folk culture, who are Shango, uh, Ogun and Yemaya, the god of thunder, the god of iron, and the goddess of female, all female power. Uh, so they, they started, this is a, 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 a big interpretation of the play, and it, it makes it very interesting. So let's take a quick look at the beginning of that.
So the next one is uh, this Othello remix uh, produced by the Q Brothers, who are a hip-hop ensemble from Chicago, working with the Chicago Shakespeare Festival. Uh, and this is quite a remarkable production. And this one goes even further in interpretation because the entire play is rewritten. Uh, the methodology that the writer used was to take the text of Othello and sit and write line by line and change the first draft was to change every line in the play into a hip-hop rhyme. And then to condense that, take it, change it, and then the whole play is produced by four guys. Um, and it was a, a, a stunning success, sold out. It was the, the most popular play of the festival, probably because it was only one of two that were in English. Uh, but it's, but it's, qu it's quite, quite something. So let's look at a little bit of that. Fast. So we hope you're listening. We're about to tell a story that's been told throughout history. Willie Shakes was a master. No one can ignore that. But he borrowed his stories from the Greeks before that. So what we're doing is keeping the tradition, tradition alive. alive. Here's the latest version. This edition's in rhyme. We're on a mission to find the essence of the story. To put a new twist on an old allegory. Hip hop. That's the way we're going to take you straight to the place that we, we can, can relate to. Good storytellers borrow. But great, great ones still don't believe me. The thievery is how, how we keep, keep it real. real. On to the story about this one fellow. The greatest MC, MC Othello. Now I know what you're thinking. Hold on just a minute, that's a tragedy. Yup, but there's comedy in it. We four fellas, humble storytellers, will weave the tale of a man who gets jealous. Othello changed the game when he came out. Releasing free mixtape just to get his name out. The scene hadn't seen an MC so inspired in some time. The rhymes he combined were straight fire like. I got a lot of drama harder than Madonna in a sauna when she let you do a body shot of vodka on her. Oh. I'm so sick of it, cause I'm in a fifth of gin. People waking up and doing it again, you listening? Hey. I'm trying to be the American dream. So put me in coach, I can carry the team. Oh. Better know y'all bourbon in a low ball. Standing so tall, smell the tracks like a snowfall. Oh. Oh. Dropping sick underground tracks for two years. Till he had every big wig in the industry's ear. He evolved from an artist who could pen rhymes fat. To a brilliant songwriter and went ten, ten times flat. The critics called him the greatest poet of the century. He rose to the top like he was meant to be. Throw your hands up! Throw your hands up! Out of the ghetto, looking for the loop, but there was nothing. 
got a wicked jump shot. I couldn't shoot, so I grabbed the microphone. Spitting stories for these people from the place I call home. I survived the impossible. Caught a game, caught fire, and crawled to the hospital. My hood was riots and uprising. Mama so cracked out, she don't recognize me. Had to get up from my... That I wanted to share with the, with the prisoners, who I had been, I had had contact with some of them before. And these are guys that are, have self-selected. I mean, they've, they've pursued education while they're in prison. And uh, what interests me is transformation. This is the thing that has interested me throughout my career. And it's the reason that I've moved from documenting <coughs> the lives of people like John Coltrane, and Miles Davis, Frank Zappa, Leonard Bernstein, because these are people who deal with music on a very high level and a transformative level. And it's music that's multidimensional and music that, that is, that can transform people's lives. So when I started my Shakespeare documentary, which was six years ago, I wasn't exactly sure how I would put the story together and exactly what it was. What I was trying to do was to paint a picture of Shakespeare now, Shakespeare in the modern world. What does Shakespeare mean to us? And who is Shakespeare for? Who, who is involved with Shakespeare? And one of the methods that I use in all my documentaries is to go and find the most brilliant, the most exciting, the most articulate, and the most passionate people and have them tell the story. So it's not me telling the story. And that worked with Miles Davis, it worked with Coltrane, worked with Bernstein, and I hoped it would work with Shakespeare. And I'm now up to 240 interviews. They started all in audio, because I was working in, in radio. It was going to be an NPR series. And about halfway through, I switched over and started shooting in uh, high-definition video and have returned to my early education in, in film. And, it, and I'm finding that very exciting. It's, and it's, it's good to make a transition because when you do something for 20-something years, you get a little bored. So uh, the point was to try to go in and see if this would work. And it was also, once I got the permission, which was, a, it was really just a couple of months ago, the question was, for me, was, okay, I'm going to go in, I'm going to teach this class, I'm going to show these three videos, and then engage the men in conversations. And then we're going to have a film crew, so we're going to record the audio. The audio could be used in the radio documentary. The video could be put on our website. And then there's another question, which is still slightly to be answered, although I'm going to pursue it, which is can I make a standalone film about this experience, about these five days that I spent? And what it means is that it's going to be a primarily conversation-based film. It's going to be a, a film about conversations and about people speaking from their heart and about their reaction to these, to these videos. Now, we'll have the luxury of being able to use excerpts from these films, so that'll pick up the, the pace a little. But this is, the, you know, this is like we shot this stuff two weeks ago, and I'm very excited to show you just these little pieces. It's completely, really, it's unedited. Uh, it hasn't been, I haven't adjusted the sound, I haven't adjusted the colors, uh, but I'm just, the, the, the timing was this sort of a coincidence of, of me being here, so I want to show you these things. And um, last night at dinner, we were speaking with Maggie Ensign, and among other people. It was a table of brilliant people. Uh, and, and one of the things, that Maggie, Maggie is a playwright, but she also is a teacher. And the question was asked to her, because she moved from kindergarten to middle school, could she tell because she had some of the same students, could she tell the difference, or could she predict that the kids who were good in kindergarten, would they be good in sixth grade? Would the kids who were bad in kindergarten still be bad in sixth grade? And she said, yeah, it was pretty predictable. What I'm, what I'm pursuing in talking to these prisoners is, can we always predict? Because these guys that you're about to meet, all of them, had very troubled childhoods. They had childhoods that lacked in a lot of areas. Uh, they did not, they're not well educated. They're highly intelligent. Something about these 
particular 14 guys that are in the room made them change and made them want to pursue a different way of looking at the world. And their world expanded. And it was a question of looking. And, and you'll see there is a little bit of explanation in what I'm going to show you. But the issue of transformation, if it's possible, and how Shakespeare and other forms of education can f fall into that is, it's, it's, not, it's not predictable. And I, but I, but I want to know, and I'm going to ask and try to pursue to find out if it's repeatable. So let's take a look at some of these things, and we can, we can chat about it. Um, one of the themes that really stuck out and had an impact on me was manhood. What is manhood? And the reason is because in Othello, and I want to say the hip-hop version, the remix, it brought up a lot of creativity. Like we wrote the rap, I wrote mine like family. I haven't done that in a long time, so that was really cool. But the theme of manhood in a, in a way that Othello, he kills his wife. And I've said, and I relate that to my own idea of manhood because to me I seen it as he bought into the idea of I'm the king, everyone's supposed to treat me and be this way around me. And I think that's what allowed his insecurities to surface. Like for myself, I was in a long-term relationship before I came to prison, but I was only in one relationship. I only had one girlfriend, so I was kind of like inexperienced in a way. And I remember a situation came up and it was like, I would easily believe that she would cheat on me. She would deceive me or use me or whatever. And it was because in my mind, what I'm getting from Shakespeare and Othello was that I bought into the idea that she was my girl. I'm the man. Everybody knows me. I had a reputation in the hood. Don't tarnish that reputation. So being my woman meant you were my woman. So it was easy for me to see in Othello that being a man is not seeing a woman or your wife or your girlfriend as your possession. So it was like another layer revealed to me that I had to start analyzing about myself. Did I ever feel that way? Was those insecurities because I believed in that type of ideology or perspective or whatever? And it made me see like moving towards that vulnerability. Like we all talk about not trusting and being deceived. We see all that in Shakespeare. But I think it's maybe moving towards vulnerability is what makes a man a man. Going into the uncertainty. And I think that's why I, I keep the name Casper. I don't know. So I, that's what it brought up for me. Um, I, uh, the themes of the film and the discussions that brought up for me, uh, I'll start with Othello first. Um, that is major domestic violence. Uh, I have never hit a woman, but there are different forms of domestic violence. Uh, we need to stop and think for a change. And I have learned through life that in a matter of seconds, your life can change for the worst. But if you stop and think for a change, just that for that split, for three seconds, it doesn't have to be that way. Uh, he killed her because he let another man make him delusional. He didn't stop, he didn't think, he just, he didn't confront or speak to the woman the way he should have. He should have had the communication. And uh, Winner's Tale, there's a different form of domestic violence for me, which is more like a mental domestic violence because she died because of her anguish. Uh, a big thing there that hits me hard is the child abandonment. Uh, I screwed up in this life and I know I have, but I know in my heart that I need to get out there and I need to be with my little girl and I need to try and rebuild whatever was lost and I try to, I gotta try and put this together. It's if they allow me to be a part of that. Now, I gotta prove myself. I gotta build my life and I gotta show them and I gotta say, look, I'm here if you need me. Please call upon me anytime, but I can't impose myself because that is a form of 
domestic violence going out there and thinking that I'm entitled to be there and be a part of that life. No. I abandoned that whole concept when I did like in King Henry IV. I started hanging out with people, undesirable people, and doing undesirable things, robbing and fighting and drugs and stuff like that. And he, thank God, well, because of the story, had a moment of epiphany early and was able to change his life. I, unfortunately, needed to come to prison to actually see the light. When, when we when we used to re rehearse with Macbeth, and I started to see how the, how it was unfolding, what what made me feel like I could really play the part and 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 be a part of the the production was because I could relate to the story. I know what it is the the one, you know, one of what by any means necessary to push people out your way. I I know how that felt. I know. I know the 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 griminess of the streets and stuff like that. That's that's how I I seen the correlation. I know I know how it is to to be somebody's friend and like someone may mention the other day and not really be a friend but want something that and trying to push them out the way so I could I could get that position. And like well I actually could see Macbeth in a universal way. Like I could see the fact that Every man, whether it's, you, it's funny too about how, how they doing it in the global theater with how they got so many different languages but they using the, the Shakespeare plays and how they able to, to relate the plays to their everyday living is because human nature is, 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 is something that's, that's, that, that all of us have. You know, it's, it's like Shakespeare, he just showed us really that he was a master at understanding human nature. So, I mean, at the end of the day, you know, it, it's, it's self-explanatory, you know, that, that is, it's someone that really sat there and seen so many, so many tragedies or seen so many different, like living life from many different angles and many different levels and was able just to put them out in stories and stuff, you know, so he was, he was with, with what we would call in, in a hip hop world. He he was a storyteller. He knew how to see things in the street, see things around him, and jot it down and put it together. Because a lot of us, you know, coming from the backgrounds that we come from, like you said, from. Um, a mindset through the influence of the conditioning of those before us in the sense that you know you might have had uncles, parents, grandparents that have a deep sense of hatred towards the American society because of the ills and the things that they have experienced perhaps through the reconstruction era of you know being promised certain lands and that lands being revoked through, you know, having to go through sharecropping and to go through, you know, picking cotton where your family would have to pick cotton with their bare hands and they speak about, you know, their hands bleeding and being sore and to having to walk and actually carry a gun to protect yourself from Ku Klux Klan members and things of that nature. I understand their conditioning now, but it conditioned their mind to a certain way to present it to you a certain way to say, well, you know, we've been through all this because of this, which was slavery. And then you equate slavery with your long, young mind with whites and the establishment of the society. And so it breeds in you this contempt for American society. And for a young mind, 
not really having the rationale, not really knowing the history, not really knowing the, the in depths of how, what actually took place and why it took place. Because maybe these parents couldn't explain it because they didn't know. So it influenced your mind to have a certain view. So, so for me growing up and for many inner city youth or people that of my um, background, we kind of have a, a, a leeriness to things of that nature. So it, 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 it speaks to the truth about a lot of individuals saying, well, Shakespeare, I don't want to do Shakespeare. Why should I do Shakespeare? Yeah. And but as you know, a person becoming conscious and seeking out the certain knowledge to understand history, I understood that we had a long history, long before the Atlantic slave trade, and that we came from prosperous civilizations and had a prosperous culture, language, and things of that nature. So you become hungry for that. And so some guys, when they reach that point, they become bitter in a sense and say, well, why should I do Shakespeare? And I don't know anything about my history. I don't know anything about Western Africa, Ghana, you know, Senegal, the Congo. I don't know nothing about Nigeria. I don't know nothing about South Africa. I don't know nothing about Shaka Zulu. I don't know nothing about certain civilizations that flourished on the Nile Valley, you know? I don't know nothing about these things. So why should I want to learn this? So it becomes that debate too as well. And that's a, a conversation that has its validity and has its weight and also when you spoke about having a broad mind, you know, I come to understand that there's no one history, black history, there's nothing but world history. And just as literature, and just as the arts, and just as Shakespeare art, it doesn't just belong to what we have confined, the social constraints that we put on, and these labels that we put on things, as far as we saying, well, you know, Shakespeare, it's, belongs to a white guy that lived in a certain time period and lived in London and so forth in that nature. But that his work transcends time and space. It transcends cultural bounds. It transcends history. And it's a work that stands upon its own that speaks truth to creativity. And that creative art, in my opinion, we all stand on the shoulders of those that came before us in the human experience. Whether you're white, black, green, yellow, it doesn't matter. So I experienced uh, racism, I experienced racial profiling. You know, I mean, a neighborhood I used to live in in Queens, which was what we lived in, we moved to a house in Queens. Uh, there were groups of, uh, you know, uh, white kids and even American black kids and American Spanish kids, they used to go around attacking Indians, you know. That was the reality, the way I came up. So I, that, that played a part in me, um, my, my, my being shaped and mold to feel that I had to defend myself, I had to fight back and, and you know, my, I think it, it affected my self-esteem and my worldview became warped. So I I, 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 it came from experience of what I was experiencing. My reaction to it was, these guys respect violence, you know? So I started to fight back as a kid, and then I started to pick up weapons, and I started to realize that these guys respect a person who would just shoot them. And, you know, one thing led to another, and I got involved in lifestyle, drug game lifestyle, criminal lifestyle, and I just, my life went downhill. No, I never thought of myself as a bad person. I'm, I'm, I'm at home with my family, my parents, my mother, my father, my older brother, my younger brother. You know, I never uh, even thought about those things, like whether I was a good person or a bad person. I'm just living life as I was being confronted with it and, and, and as I was experiencing it. You know, the idea of being a good person and a bad person didn't start happening until after I came to prison. You know, so like I was saying, I came to prison with the same mentality that was shaped and molded in the streets as a result of my experience, and I, I, I felt the same way in prison. So in prison, I, I, I practiced the same violent behavior in all the different prisons that I've been to. And um, as a result, you know, you don't just dish it out, you get some back. 
So I was getting it back also, you know, I became a, a, a person that was subject to violence on several occasions as a result of my thinking, as a result of my behavior. And then, you know, as time went by, I came to realize that I was bringing all this upon myself. My mind is uh, like, a, like, like a, a natural course of events started to take place, a, a rational thinking started to come about, you know, because I, I, I got hurt bad a few times. You know, as you can see, I got cut before, I've been stabbed, I've been hit with a weight. You know, and I realized that my, my, my reckless and stupid behavior was the one that was really bringing this stuff to me. You know, I can't expect to dish it out and not get it back. So, and, and that started to really make me feel, you know, what it feels like to, uh, um, that, and, and think about right from wrong and stuff like that. And it's not right. It's not right to hurt anyone. No one should get hurt. That's a reality. That's a reality. Guys, the, this is a predatory environment. This is an environment where the strong rules over the weak. And even in a, uh, a, a prison like this where there is no uh, really much uh, tension going on, but there is still ever present, it's natural with the prison atmosphere that there's gonna be guys that feel stronger over the weaker guys. And there are guys that if they feel they could take advantage and they could do something to somebody, they would do it if they could. So it does make us a little vulnerable. We're going against the grain. We're going upstream in, 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 trying to, in doing the right thing, right? Against so many people that are not doing the right thing. And there has to be a level of strength and fortitude maintained at all times. Because people might think, oh yeah, well he used to be a bad guy, but he's not gonna be a bad guy no more. He's not gonna do nothing. You know, maybe I could try doing something to him or something like that. You know, so you, you have to maintain strength in here all the time. That's a reality. The preceding program is copyrighted by Emory University.